Hey, Dog Nation, I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Two things to say off the top here. First of all, could not be happier about being back today. Really excited about that. You may also be able to tell. I've got a weird thing going on in my throat right now. I really apologize. I know this is kind of irritating and annoying, but we're going to try to soldier through that because I'm really excited about today's show. Obviously, a lot on what I think is the controversial decision by the SEC, apparently, Georgia apparently going along with this to change the schedule between the Bulldogs and the Auburn Tigers. We'll talk about that. We'll address the rollout of Georgia's defensive coordinator and why I think that's also a bit strange. Mike Griffith is going to be here today to give his thoughts on both of those subjects, and we're going to have a lot of fun. We haven't done this in a while. It's great to be doing it today as Dog Nation Daily begins right now. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I said this to our video audience before the show began, so let me say this to the podcast and radio folks as well. I am, first of all, thrilled about being back today. We have not done Dog Nation Daily in a while. It's fun to be doing this again. I also have a weird thing going on with my throat. I don't quite know what this is. Uh, I'll go years without getting sick. I just don't get sick. Don't get headaches, don't get colds, don't get anything. But I have been dealing with a little bit of a throat thing over the course of the uh, last couple of days, so I'm sure I sound a little bit weird. I'm sure that's a little bit annoying. But I'll do my part to soldier through, and hopefully by tomorrow I'll be back sounding like my normal self, and you can decide for yourself, I guess, if that's an improvement when, you, when we get to that point again. But nonetheless, there is a lot to talk about today, and a lot has happened since I was gone from this chair. And a lot of it off the top of the program is going to center around what started as a rumor, started as a, hey, this might happen, and then you blink your eyes and it has happened. Georgia's going to move its game with Auburn up into the season. Uh, Dog Nation's reported likely in the month of October. Uh, away from its traditional date in November, the Deep South's oldest rivalry. Apparently, tradition does not matter that much anymore. Uh, that game's not going to be played when it's used to being played. It's going to be playing um, you know, much earlier in the year now. And there are some reasons, I believe, justifiably, the Georgia fans are not too happy about this. And I want to kind of go through some of this right now. Let me start with something that uh, Georgia President Dr. Jerry Moorhead had to say yesterday. It just so happened that the um, uh, athletic board or whatever was having a meeting yesterday. So uh, uh, Dog Nation was on hand for that. Chip Towers got kind of an interesting quote from the University of Georgia president. And uh, apparently, from the pr- perspective of Moorhead, the scuttlebutt about this, the, the issue around all of this stuff, Apparently, to, to Moorhead, it's not necessarily that big of a deal. What Moorhead told Dog Nation was, uh, I don't have uh, much reaction to the decision. As I understand it, the conference has switched Auburn and Tennessee, and, you know, they had their reasons for doing it. I suppose if I was looking at the schedules, the key for me would be asking if the head football coach is happy with the schedule, and as our athletic director vetted it properly, all those things have been done. That's Jerry Moorhead speaking to Dog Nation yesterday. But It's the last part of that that I think is going to be a very important issue for us to address here today. Uh, Moorhead says, um, if the head coach is happy with the schedule, well, we don't know a ton about what Kirby Smart thinks about anything, but in terms of his previous public statements about this, I think there's some reasons to believe that he, based on what he said in the past, might not necessarily be truly happy with the way this has played out right now because, as I understand Kirby's own words, His issue in the past has not been when the Auburn game was played, but the nature of the Auburn road game in the same year that Georgia also goes to uh, Georgia Tech. So let me let you hear Kirby Smart from just this past summer on that very subject. Yeah, absolutely. We get a chance to to fix that and return the favor that we paid to them. I hear about that a lot. Obviously, I wasn't there, but um, about the two times they had to travel back to back, I think if we can make it more consistent and we balance things out, probably be helpful in the long run, but I got a feeling there's more to it than just us and them. You know, it always affects so many other moving parts, but it would be nice to do that. I think the language that Kirby Smart uses there is very interesting. At the beginning of that statement, he says, return the favor that we paid to Auburn. That's negotiation language. That's a reminder of, we did something for you before, now it's your turn to do something for us. That could be directed straight to Auburn, that could be directed to the SEC, it could be directed to whomever. That's Kirby Smart saying, hey, in the past, we've done something for you. Now it's time for you to return the favor to us. I think that language is very important. But the other thing you hear from Kirby Smart is not a complaint about the fact that the Auburn game comes late in the season, because that's Auburn's issue with this. For for Auburn, this is more about the home and away situation. It's the fact that it has to play its two biggest rivals and two toughest opponents within the same frame of time, both in the month of November, every single year. 
That's Auburn's issue with this. They don't like the home and uh, away part of it either, but their bigger issue is the is the uh, um, the closeness of the games between Georgia and Alabama. Kirby Smartson doesn't bring that up. He brings up the fact that it's on the road at uh, Auburn and on the road at Georgia Tech at, at the end of the same year. So so that that's Kirby Smart's issue on this. So based on that, the fact that uh, Georgia has now traded uh, Auburn for Tennessee, that doesn't alleviate that problem. So if we take Kirby Smart as a word then, the trade for Auburn for Tennessee, that's not an example of Kirby Smart getting what he wants on this. Let me let you hear from more from Kirby to submit that uh, point a little further. Yeah, I feel like if we can fix it from that perspective, it would help, and it would help with not having two road games back-to-back for us in the situation we had like this year with the Auburn and the Georgia Tech back-to-back. But it's not exactly the way high up on the priority list. I understand there's problems and difficulties trying to appease everybody, especially with the SEC uh, conference having to do it. The way I understand it, the reason it happened the first time was because of the addition of the two teams. So, once again, you hear Kirby Smart all about the home and away part of this, the fact that uh, the, the Georgia schedule got messed up back in 2012 when the league expanded, bringing in Missouri and Texas A&M. Georgia had its hand in the air to go uh, help out the league by uh, going to Auburn two years in a row. Didn't put up much of a fight. Complained about that very much then. And the schedule's been messed up ever since. Now, uh, <laughs> you know... <laughs> It certainly seemed like it very easy for the SEC to make that move back then. All of a sudden now, it's moving heaven and earth to get the uh, favor return for Georgia. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the way that it goes. Now, as far as the role that Greg McGarity plays in all of this, his desire to fight for Georgia, well, he says that's exactly what he's doing. He's just choosing to do it all behind closed doors. McGarity, once again, the same Dog Nation story that Chip Towers wrote yesterday, says that every school advocates for its own desires. You get in a room, and if there are certain things you want to discuss about moving or changing, There are 14 athletic directors that do that. Everybody advocates for their own. The one thing we don't do is talk about those conversations. We follow SEC protocol, which is to talk about it in the room when you're developing schedules. There are things we advocate for that nobody ever really knows about. That's the purpose of going through that exercise. You don't talk about it in public. What we talked to uh, the commissioner and uh, Mark Womack about uh, regarding scheduling, there have been several times they've helped us uh, with things that are important to our football coaches. Once again, that's Greg McGarity. You can read the full piece from Chip Towers at dognation.com. A couple issues for me on that. First of all, on this idea of we advocate for things all the time that nobody really knows about. That just leads me to believe that you're not getting your way. If you're advocating for things behind closed doors and we, the average rank-and-file fans, never hear about it, I don't know how you're well you're advocating then if it never becomes public to us because either you're getting stuff that's so ins- inconsequential it kind of you know flies below the surface flies below the radar or, or you're just not simply getting your way at all you're only uh, arguing your case behind closed doors because pretty clearly here while you say hey we're following SEC protocol we're doing this all, all this behind closed doors well congratulations to you for being the teacher's pet on all this saying hey we don't take our stuff publicly we do it behind closed doors. But your counterpart in this particular negotiation, Auburn Athletic Director Alan Green, did go public on this. He did put up a public fuss about this. And guess what? Less than a year later, he's getting his way. Because if you want to go back to November, Alan Green was speaking at one of those uh, touchdown club deals, AL.com, the big website that covers uh, Alabama and Auburn, was on hand. What Green told Auburn fans at the time was, it doesn't matter how spaced out the games are, just not having to play Georgia and Alabama in the last three games of the year just some breathing room. I think it's better for the conference that way as well. Now, he doesn't go on to say exactly how it is better for the conference, but it's clearly better for Auburn. He goes public, and he got his way. And this Auburn versus Georgia battle, this is a win for Auburn against Georgia. They do get the space they wanted between these two series, and Georgia just simply flip-flops Auburn for Tennessee. It is very difficult to see how Georgia got anything for this whatsoever. And if Georgia did gain something from this, it's the job of McGarity or Smart or somebody to step up and explain how UGA benefits from this because as the average fan sees it, uh, there's nothing in this for Georgia whatsoever. It's another example, much like the uh, back-to-back trips to Auburn in 2012 and uh, 2013 uh, or the, uh, the situation coming up this November on Cupcake Saturday when everybody else is playing you know, Citadel and uh, you know, whomever and Georgia's playing what's likely to be a top-10 tech, Texas A&M team uh, the, uh, the, the day before rivalry weekend. It always seems like George, like the teacher's pet, has its hand in the air ready to volunteer for whatever the SEC dishes out. And all that seems to lead to is more opportunities to get pushed around. Because after all, the whole idea of the scheduling flip for Auburn and Georgia, 
to me, that's a solution in search of a problem. Georgia has dominated Auburn, I think, what, 11 of the last 14 they've won? Haven't lost at Georgia Tech since 1999. The, the nature of these two road games connected closely together, that hasn't seemed to matter very much in the, in the case of either series. Georgia doesn't lose at Georgia Tech and doesn't lose to Auburn much, period. But nonetheless, Georgia was ready to volunteer and do exactly what the SEC wanted, in this case, exactly what Auburn wanted. And as I said before, all that seems to lead to are more opportunities when you are there just getting pushed around by somebody who's more than happy to bully you if you're willing to take it. Take last night in basketball, for instance. Now, I know it may seem like a little bit of a stretch to draw a line between what happened between Georgia and Auburn in the scheduling boardroom and what happened with Georgia and Mississippi State last night in the basketball floor. But if you saw this, you know what I'm talking about. Late in the game, less than a minute to go. In fact, even less than that, half a second to go, I guess. Uh, something gets thrown on the floor, technical foul. Uh, Mississippi State gets the extra free throw and uh, shoots the, uh, the shot that uh, wins the game. And, um, you know, Tom Crane at the end of the game was obviously, uh, you know, very frustrated by this. It was, it was the kind of unorthodox thing that you just don't, you don't see happen very much around the SEC, but it just so happens this, once again, happened to George. In fact, here is Crane with his own complaint about it. To my knowledge, I'm 52 years of age, been head coach for 19 years, been assistant and other coaching since I was 18 in college, since I was 20. I've never seen that, not without a warning, and certainly without an explanation. I just saw something land on the floor, so my first reaction is to go to the, grab the mic myself. We're in it together, I've done it my whole career, because that usually takes care of it. And I've had officials in the past, you know, thank me for doing it, right? I mean, it's just part of the game. I didn't even know, I didn't even know we assessed the technical until I turned the coaches, tell me what's going on. So, not like anybody came and explained anything to me. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody that works for Georgia, on behalf of Tom Crane, would go public today to say, we were robbed last night by an egregious officiating error, by an overstepping of the power of the officials? Wouldn't it be nice if that happened? Wouldn't it be nice if somebody for Georgia went public on the opposite side of Auburn AD, Alan Green, to say, I know that you want uh, this scheduling change. Here's why it's not in our best interest to do that. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody argued on Georgia's behalf in that regard? That's not the Georgia way, apparently, though. According to McGarity's own words, they do all of their bidding behind closed doors. And publicly, it's just appease, 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 appease. It's almost as if... You know, Greg McGarity has become like the Neville Chamberlain of the SEC in all of this. Appease, 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 appease. Well, you can appease uh, long enough. We're all speaking German because uh, what seems to be happening is another case of Georgia just being pushed around. My name is uh, Brandon Adams. This is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It is great to be back with you today. And as I said off the top of the program, I'm so sorry for the quality of my voice today. I really do apologize for that. But uh, nonetheless, we're really having a good time being back on the show, dealing with some of the big issues that have been going on the, the last couple of days, including the big thing yesterday with uh, the Georgia-Auburn schedule change. I don't like it at all. I don't see what's in this for Georgia. I'd love to have somebody for Georgia go into further explanation for why this is a trade they were wanting to make. If Kirby Smart's on board with this, he needs to speak out. Uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll criticize McGarity for his role in all of this, but at some point in time, Kirby Smart's got to come out of the shadows. Kirby Smart's got to stop hiding behind this veil of secrecy so much and express his own thoughts about stuff like this and stop, you know, ha- having to have this stuff interpreted by something he said, uh, you know, uh, half a year ago. Um, he, he's he's got to start speaking up a little bit more on his uh, feelings on stuff like this, be that advocate for Georgia himself, because he's certainly got the mouthpiece and the power to be able to do that. But for none, none, either way, we're going to push that aside for right now and say uh, good to have you with us live on video, 10 a.m., Dog Nation, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, back on the radio today at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref and in podcast form as well with our uh, friends uh, on, on podcast, Apple Podcasts, the Google Podcast Player, everything in, pl- in between, including the world famous dognation.com. We're just really glad to have you as a part of the program today. Coming up in a moment, we'll get some thoughts from our buddy Mike Griffith and all of this as well. Mike's been very close in on this subject, following it very closely. We'll get some thoughts on him on this. Before that, though, let's go around the doghouse here, presented by uh, Online Trading Academy today. And another big piece of news that happened while I was gone was it became official, I guess, but the situation with Georgia's defensive coordinator. Um, and this is another example of an, a very odd rollout, a very odd public declaration. It looks to me that Dan Lanning is the Georgia defensive coordinator. Now, there is some confusion because on the open records request 
that was uh, uh, put out by Dog Nation and others, when the titles and the, and, and the names come out, you've got Glenn Schumann listed as a co-defensive coordinator. I honestly believe in this case, though, that co is one of those words in college football or uh, in this case, I guess, a prefix in college football that just doesn't have any real meaning anymore, much the same way that commitment to a recruit. That word in college football doesn't quite mean what it means uh, you know, outside the world of college football anymore. Committed means that you are fully locked in for uh, many recruits. That's not what committed means anymore. The same thing, too, with offers. You know, uh, Georgia will offer 100 and something uh, people this year for uh, only 25 potential scholarships. The scholarship offer, that word doesn't quite mean what it used to mean. And in college football, it has an entirely different meaning. I think you can add the co defensive coordinator uh, phrase into that as well, not meaning in the world of college football what it means other places. Because in this particular case, I think it's just a title that's been given to Glenn Schumann. If you look at the salaries both these guys made last year and the big bump that Dan Lanning's getting this year, it certainly appears that Dan Lanning's going to be the defensive coordinator at Georgia. Much the same way at Tennessee last year, Kevin Shearer was listed as defensive coordinator. Chris Rumpf was listed as co-defensive coordinator. But nobody thought those two guys were sharing those responsibilities. It was Shearer who was thought to be the Tennessee defensive coordinator. You've got the same thing going on here. Now, later on in the program, I, I was going to do it now, but I think we're kind of running a little bit late. I'm going to let you hear some from uh, Dan Lanning on, on on all of this, what he said back at the Sugar Bowl. We'll, we'll let you decide for yourself. You know, did Georgia do as well uh, as well as it could have? Did it do as good a job as it could have in, in, in terms of rolling this out and propping him up as the new defensive coordinator of the program? I think there's reason to suggest that it did not. We'll certainly talk more about that and let you hear from Lanning in his own words in just a moment. For now, though, let me remind you that uh, Around the Doghouse today is brought to you by Online Trading Academy. Online Tr- Trading Academy provides professional instruction on how you can make money in the markets. Our students learn a step-by-step approach to trading and investing that covers a spectrum of trading styles and asset classes. It's in the classroom and online. So make the best possible decision you can make to invest in yourself. It's the best money you'll ever spend because it's the kind of thing that's going to return value on that investment over and over again, year after year, once you learn how to manage those markets and, and, and make money in the markets, you'll never regret that decision. Simply go to tradingacademy.com slash Atlanta. That's tradingacademy.com slash Atlanta, and you can be uh, making money in the markets. And wouldn't that be a fun way to uh, make your 2019 better than ever before? We appreciate Online Trading Academy being a part of Dog Nation Daily and Around the Doghouse. All right, we'll hear from Dan Lanning what he said about this back in January uh, later on in the uh, program. For now, though, for more on the uh, Greg McGarry situation, the uh, the Kirby Smart role in this Auburn decision and kind of everything else that goes along with all of this. Let's talk to our buddy Mike Griffith right now. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let me say hello to uh, Mike Griffith, who's uh, had some great reporting on all of this going on with uh, Georgia over the last couple of days, and it's good to share, get, get a chance to hear more of his thoughts on this subject. Mike, I know that Thursday's not your normal day to be on Dog Nation Daily, but we appreciate you being here nonetheless and hope you're uh, doing well. I hope that, you know, I'm doing great. Everybody's excited to back DA, so yeah, I hope you're doing well too. I am doing well. Uh, once again, I'll apologize for a little bit of a scratchy throat today. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear me okay. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it is really good to be back here. And let me uh, talk on air about something that you and I kind of exchanged some uh, thoughts on Twitter about a little earlier this week. I played the audio from Kirby Smart at the uh, spring meetings in Destin um, and the show a little earlier, and based on those comments. Kirby complaining about the back-to-back road games against Auburn and Georgia Tech to close that season. Based on those comments, it's not entirely obvious to me that Kirby Smart would be happy with the trade of Auburn for Tennessee because, to my understanding, that doesn't alleviate the problem that Kirby thinks he has with those two road games late in the year. But people just seem to be operating on the assumption that Kirby Smart must be fine with this. I, I don't know where that's coming from necessarily based on what he said in the past. How would you uh, respond to all of that? Well, I do know where it's coming from. I mean, I've, I've talked to the people that, you know, around Kirby Smart, and, and, you know, the lay of the land at Georgia is a little different maybe than other places, and maybe than what we used to think about um, from a traditional standpoint. You know, there was a time when we looked at the administration and the athletic directors as, is making, you know, the most important decisions and having the authority. And, and I think that's ultimately still true. But when it comes to Kirby Smart, 
Um, it's a matter of administrators recognizing that, that Kirby's not your average football coach with the whistle around his neck. I mean, this is a guy who has a business degree from Georgia. I mean, this is a 43-year-old man making $6 million a year who within two years almost won a national championship uh, and played for in the national championship game. So the people around Kirby, the administrators, the athletic director, the school president, the board of trustees, um, yeah, Kirby works for them, but they trust Kirby. You know, it, it's kind of like when you do your show, VA. You know, we all know that you know what you're doing when you get behind the camera and in front of a microphone. And, and while you may have the same managers I do, our managers recognize that you know what you're doing. And if VA wants to do a show on this, they're going to let them. And, and it's kind of like that with Kirby Smart. If Kirby Smart uh, either wants or is good with the schedule change, they trust Kirby Smart's judgment. And if Kirby wasn't, here's the important thing. If Kirby wasn't good with it, Georgia would not sign off with it. So here's the thing, Mike. If, if, if that's true, what you're saying, and uh, Kirby Smart's got to come out of the shadows on this then. He, he's got to remove the veil of secrecy, and somebody on Georgia's behalf has got to explain why this is a better decision. So somebody why? On... Why did he got to come out of the shadows? See, you know, that's another thing that's different. You, you and I would have said, I think fans probably would have said, Kirby's got to tell us who the defensive coordinator is going to be. Kirby's got to say some things about uh, promoting Dan to defensive coordinator. Kirby's got to talk on national. Kirby doesn't have to do anything for the general public or for the media. Now, if you're a donor, if you're a high-dollar donor, then you get to go to Georgia scrimmages. And Kirby's going to make sure you know what you need to know if you're putting money in the coffers. But Kirby Smart doesn't need to deal with the media or the fans when he's winning 11 and 12 games a year. He doesn't need to do it, and there's no point in it. Because him telling the media or him telling the fans that, you know, well, I'm good with it, what good is it? Who cares? Who cares if you're good with it? So Kirby's good with it. Sure. So, so take the media part out of this for a moment, because it's the average fans right now who are weighing in on this. It's the average fans who are, who are upset. And I guess... I mean, I am also just like them, very curious of, I mean, what Georgia is getting out of this. From, from your perspective, what is Georgia gaining from making this trade? Well, I think there's a couple things they're getting out of it. One, um, it, it does help remove the Auburn, Georgia Tech, the potential for two road games within three weeks against rivals. Okay? High, high rivals. I think Kirby looks at Georgia as, as, excuse me, I think Kirby looks at Auburn as more of a rival right now, more of a threat to Georgia than Tennessee. I mean, I, I, think, that's what, I think that's the way he views it. Here's the other thing. If you're playing Auburn in November, you might be playing them again two or three weeks later in the SEC championship game. That's not the case if it's Tennessee. Right, but just, be, but, but just be clear about one thing. The Tennessee-Auburn schedule right now is on the same, uh, you know, pattern right now where you know georgia plays at tennessee the same year it plays at auburn so f from what kirby smart has said about alleviating the issue with those late road games tennessee does not solve that problem because georgia is in knoxville the same years that it's at auburn i guess kirby smart's gamble or kirby smart's look into the future is that that's a healthier situation than auburn um again i think the one thing that's different is that there's always a chance you could face auburn in a rematch in the sec championship game uh, two or three weeks later. That's what happened a couple of weeks, couple of years ago when they played Auburn and Georgia Tech in back-to-back -back weeks, and that was something Kirby addressed at spring meeting. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. Uh, that wouldn't be the situation in Tennessee, but the rest of that just seems really odd to me and very, very difficult to explain. Let me talk about something else kind of related to this for a moment. And you're a guy that's, you know, covered a lot of college football for a long time, and you've been uh, obviously neck deep in this Georgia stuff over the last couple of years, and you've seen a lot of athletic directors, and you see the way that Georgia fans relate to this program's athletic director, Greg McGarity, who is coming back for at least one more year. And uh, you know, m maybe future years beyond that. Do you think that McGarity has a perception problem? Because, you know, a lot of what I get on Twitter when something like this happens is, oh, there goes Greg McGarity again. And I'll admit that while I have defended him a little bit compared to what some people have said, 
even in this particular case, I find myself thinking this just comes across as kind of a bad look for McGarity. Admittedly, that may be unfair. As someone who's getting to know Greg McGarity and getting to know his relationship with the UGA fans and his situation at Georgia, do you think that McGarity suffers from a perception problem? I think fans suffer from a perception problem. I think if they don't, if they can't look at the Georgia athletic program and see that it's the envy of the league, then then they've got a problem. They're not they're not very smart. If they can't look at the athletic director cup and see where Georgia's at, if they can't see the facilities improvement that Georgia's experiencing, the fundraising, the improvements to the stadium. I think they're just putting eleven million into a tennis stadium. I think they just won a national championship in that sport. I look at their non revenue sports, they're very strong. I look at the hire of Tom Crean. And while the record doesn't reflect it, Georgia's played two NCAA tournament teams toe-to-toe. I saw Greg McGarity and his marketing team uh, sell out six consecutive games at Steedsman Coliseum. I see Georgia with a third place in the SEC in terms of the uh, percentage of volume filled in their basketball arena with with a 1-12 team. That doesn't just happen. I've covered programs with very poor athletic directors. I'll be more pointed. Tennessee was a dumpster fire when they had their athletic director issues after Doug Dickey left. That program went from something to nothing when uh, Doug Dickey left and when Mike Hamilton got on a slippery slope. Um, Dave Hart was terrible. Their chancellor, Jimmy Cheek, was awful. You want to talk about a perception problem, let's look back at Tennessee from 2010 until Philip Fulmer's hire here, seven years of what a bad administration can do. And let's contrast that with Greg McGarity and what's happened for Georgia in that time span. Let's look at how the facilities have improved. Let's look at how they've been able to get kids into school, even while Georgia's the number 13 public institution in the country. Let's look at Kirby Smart making a public statement endorsing Greg McGarity. He's making your coach happy. He's fighting the battles that Kirby Smart wants. Get it through your head. Greg McGarity is one of the best athletic directors in the country. There are no compliance issues. The school is in the black. They can afford to pay for whoever they want to coach whatever they want. What in the world does anybody have a problem with? So let me push back on just a couple things you said there. You mentioned the tennis issue, first of all, but the money they're about to spend on tennis. But the fact is they were so delayed in spending that, that, that money, they lost the NCAA tournament at the uh, McGill Center, which had been really you know, one of the centerpieces of, uh, of UGA athletics during the spring. They lost that because of the unwillingness to spend money un- until now. Now, I'm not a big tennis fan, so that doesn't resonate with me the way that it does other people, but I do know a lot of Georgia fans who are very upset about that, which sort of lends that perception that McGarity can be too passive, much the same way that uh, this situation with the Auburn-Tennessee thing lends the perception that McGarity can be too cooperative, right? He's being cooperative with his head coach. If the fan base wants Greg McGarity to start fighting with Kirby Smart, then they really are uninformed and naive. But do you really think that uh, McGarity's giving Kirby everything that he wants? I mean, certainly... Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly no doubt seems, about it. But certainly... It seems let, me, like, let me put it like this. Okay. Let, me, let me tell you why. Let me, make, let me make the point here. Kirby Smart made a public statement about Greg McGarity after McGarity was extended. And I, and, and I think you have that public statement there and you can read it off, or you can, Michael can, or Connor can put it on the screen. Kirby Smart, I'm going to repeat this, he made a public statement about Greg McGarry. Kirby Smart did not make a public statement about promoting his defensive coordinator, or Gunn Schumann. When Kirby speaks, it is with a reason. It is calculated. It is with cause. If Kirby Smart did not completely endorse Greg McGarry, he would not have made that statement. Furthermore, if Kirby Smart did not support Greg McGarity, he would not be extended. Kirby Smart is the golden goose, and everybody's got to know that by now. If you can't see it, then you're, you're missing the boat. If you don't recognize that Kirby Smart is more than just a football coach, that Kirby Smart is a businessman, that Kirby Smart is ahead of the curve, if you can't see that, then I don't know what kind of Georgia fan you are. And if you don't recognize that Georgia is going to respect what Kirby Smart wants and work with him, then you're also missing the boat. And the guy to do that, and the guy that is doing that, is Greg McGarity. 
and, and why anybody has a problem. Like I said, Georgia's athletic program is the envy of the league right now. My goodness, there are people, do you have to just look for things to be upset about? Let me, uh, you address the uh, defensive coordinator thing a moment ago. Let me talk to you about that because you and I haven't had a chance to chat about this, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, you mentioned before, you know, and you're, I think, saying this somewhat sarcastically, but why did Georgia need to make any kind of statement about its defensive coordinator hire? The way that it happens, Mike, it's almost certainly going to be used as a negative recruiting tool against Georgia to say that Georgia doesn't have enough faith in its defensive coordinator to even announce it publicly. They tried to keep it a secret. Is that a problem? Did you think the odd way in which all this was rolled out, basically having to be unearthed from Georgia through an open records request, as opposed to any kind of like bold proclamation or exciting statement, video tribute, something along those lines? Did Georgia drop the ball on how this was handled? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. You know, I, I again, w- whenever something happens that seems out of the ordinary, and, and, it's, and it's not always like this. Now, I've, I've covered programs and coaches where I go, this guy's missing the boat, okay? And I'm, I'm not going to point out any names or anything like that, but to me there were different times and different occasions where a coach was out of touch or didn't understand the complexity of an issue. But with Kirby Smart, I really play it back, okay? I really look at it and say, now, this doesn't look right on the surface. What is Kirby seeing here that I'm not seeing? And I think I figured the, the thing out here. Kirby Smart knows what questions are going to be asked before they get asked. He knows that on the surface, the promotion of the defensive coordinator, it doesn't look good. He can't give you any reasons in a public forum that's going to make you feel any better about that promotion than what you already do. He can't point to the Sugar Bowl. The defense didn't play well. Now, they were missing some players, but, but people say that's excuses. They don't care that the best defensive lineman, the best linebacker, and the best DB did play. They still think Georgia should win by 100 points, whatever. He's not going to be able to defend it. He's not going to be able to explain it. He's not, and he, because here's the thing, because he's not going to stand up there and, and give you uh, cotton candy and gumdrops and, and just say things to say things. He's not going to do that. Kirby knows as much as the fan base knows that the proof is in the pudding. And right now, these guys are unproven. So there's nothing he could say in a public setting that would present Georgia in a more favorable light. So then why do it? Why put yourself in front of a, a group of media that's going to quite, that's going to ask all these questions and you don't really have good answers? So did it hurt him in recruiting? No, it didn't hurt him in recruiting. They still had the number one or number two class, depending on what service you use, uh, even be, without a defensive coordinator named. So, no, it, it didn't hurt him one bit. Um, again, it, it's all about Kirby Smart. Like, people believe in Georgia and Kirby Smart until given reason not to. So I think Kirby's strategy, B.A., is if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. It, it doesn't behoove him necessarily to go in front of people and try and defend the hires of some unproven guys. He believes in them. That's what he's going to tell you. But when you ask him why, he's going to say, well, because I sit with him in a room every day. But you're going to say, where's the proof? He's going to say, well, the Sugar Bowl wasn't it. So you're right. You know, the Sugar Bowl, he can't really point to anything that, that's going to make that positive in the public. So why address it? He's not, he doesn't have to address it. So I, I just I think Kirby Smart right now, and sometimes coaches start believing their own BS and can get away from being the smartest guy in the room. But right now, Kirby Smart's the smartest guy in the room, and, and I give him the benefit of the doubt. Let me do one quick final thing. I know you were there last night. Tom Crean very upset about the technical foul called late in the game. Now, Georgia may have still lost the game anyway, but the call itself is pretty egregious. And, Mike, it's the kind of thing for me that somebody needs to stand up and say, if you're Georgia, hey, this was a, a horrible, uh, you know, officiating uh, call to, uh, to, you know, without warning call this technical foul. It's the kind of thing that Georgia, I think, ought to get publicly upset about. It's the kind of thing that Georgia just doesn't really do very much and, and do very well. What was your thought on the way that unfolded last night, including what Kareem had to say about it? I, it, was, it was unbelievable. It was just, you know, like, what next? What a performance for Georgia to come from 17 down and tie that game. I mean, it was amazing. Um, I, I thought the official, now, you know, talking with Greg McGarrity afterward, he said it, it's a judgment call. It's a judgment call. The SEC officials were within their rights and their bounds to make that call. That's their judgment call. It's the way it's written. So they didn't break any rules. Now, we can argue about the judgment. I would even point to some of the calls in the final minute. I, it, it sure, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but 
you know, if Mississippi State loses that game, they, they're square on the bubble for the tournament. I mean, Mississippi State had to win that game. That would have been a very bad loss. It could have ultimately cost Mississippi State and the SEC uh, uh, team in the NCAA tournament. So if you want a conspiracy theory, go beyond the, the, the stuffed bulldog and look at the calls that were made in the last minute. Calls out of bounds, calls reviewed, not reversed. Uh, chintzy touch. I mean, it was just like, okay, which gym are we in here, right? So you're asking me about how it unfolded. Unfortunate. I've never seen it happen. Tom Crean said that. But, you know, Georgia and, and, and Crean have to be poised here. You, you don't gain anything in the long run by calling out officials, the referees, okay? It doesn't help you in the long run. And, and in the short term, even if you win that game, you're still not going to the NCAA tournament. You're still not going to the NIT. So there's no point in getting all pissy about it, to use an ugly word. But there's no point in, in getting ugly about it because it's not going to benefit you. So you handle it with, with class. You stand up for your team. You know, you, you say what happened, Crean said, in all my years of coaching, I've never seen anything like it. I didn't like it that I didn't get an explanation. You know, Greg McGarrity made it clear, hey, look, this is a judgment call. I've never seen it happen. We'll follow up behind closed doors. They're going to maintain a, a good relationship with the SEC, which, which also tells you Georgia likes where they're at. Georgia has a good relationship with Greg Sankey. Things that Georgia wants, the league works with them on. You work with them, they work with you. And, and I think Georgia is one of the best schools for doing that. Hey, Mike, it's great to talk to you. We'll look forward to reading a bunch more from you at dognation.com. We appreciate your insight, and we'll certainly catch up soon. It's fun talking with you, B.A. Have oh, a great – glad you're back. Man. Yeah, Welcome thanks. Back. I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Look, reasonable people can disagree on stuff like this, but, you know – the idea that all this stuff's going to be handled behind closed doors and, hey, we'll go through our procedural, you know, protocol to, you know, file our grievance about the technical file and we'll write it up on a sheet of paper and put it in some suggestion box somewhere where it disappears into the ether. Let's see how all that works out. Every now and then you got to do what Alan Green, the new Auburn AD, did back in November. you got to go public with your problem. And guess what? Sometimes the squeaky wheel d- does actually get the fixing. <laughs> I think there's something to be said for the way that Georgia goes about its business. The 13 other SEC schools are very thankful for it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, very, very thankful for it in, in, in some regards. Uh, I, I told you later on we're going to hear more from Dan Lanning, what he had to say about the defensive coordinator position in Georgia back in January, or I guess it would have been late December, when he spoke to the media. We'll do that in a moment. For now, though, let's do our SEC through. And before that, let me also remind you about a really good offer from our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Now, you know Pella Window and Door. They are a nationally owned company, but they've also got that local branch right here in Georgia, which means you get the power of a national company and the sort of individual attention and service of a locally owned, family-run organization. That's one of the great things about them. Uh, They can also equip your house with energy-efficient windows and doors. And listen, this time of year, that makes a a big difference. That draft from the uh, air sneaking in, you don't want that kind of stuff from your window and door. You want that nice, airtight, sealed house to keep you warm when it's raining and cold outside. Well, Pella Window and Door of Georgia can help you do that. They've also got a great offer for you. You can get up to 40% off qualifying installations or 0% APR for 48 months. And that offer is only valid through March 28th, so you need to go and act right now to uh, get in touch with them. There are a couple different ways you can do that. It's PellaSoutheast.us. That's the website, PellaSoutheast.us. Or they're done with showroom at 404-445-2979. Once again, 404-445-2979. Pella Window and Door of Georgia is viewed to be the best couple of SEC stories I want to get to here for a moment. Um, first of all, I saw where Wesley McGriff, one-time Auburn defensive backs coach, turned horrible, disastrous defensive coordinator at Ole Miss, is now back at Auburn, according to some reports. And I believe it's actually the Montgomery advertiser that may have had this first. I, if they didn't, I apologize. I don't uh, really care, but I think it was them who had it first. Um, McGriff is coming back as a defensive assistant, and I don't have a ton to say about this other than the fact that it is amazing to me there is no profession like football coaching really anywhere where, I mean, McGriff was as bad as a defensive coordinator as you can be, and he sort of you know goes from that job to like a cushy landing spot as a defensive assistant at Auburn and, uh, you know, <laughs> without having to sit a, even a single play out. Uh, coaching is a pretty nice gig if you can get it where once you're in the club, you are in the club forever. McGriff was as bad a defensive coordinator to the t- tune of, you know, Ole Miss became <laughs> – 
about the easiest team in the SEC to score against. Uh, now, he's not a defensive coordinator at Auburn. That's still a pretty good job as an assistant coach there with the Tigers. So, uh, once again, college football coaches find themselves in a very soft landing spot. And it's really one of the reasons why, even as much of a disaster and kind of a messy headache as this transfer portal turned out to be, you don't hear a lot of sympathy from the average fan but the coaches who have to deal with this because I think people just are just generally aware of just how kissed into the system coaches become once they're established in the market. They always find a landing spot. They always seem to find the opportunity to rehabilitate their career and move on. And uh, I guess from a certain standpoint, players just want the same kind of freedom and flexibility. As messy as the transfer portal is, you see the uh, coaching world of this all seems to work out pretty well for the coaches involved. Uh, speaking of Tennessee, which we've talked about a lot on the program today because that's the program that Georgia and is going to flip-flop with, with Auburn on its schedule, it certainly would seem that over the last couple of years, the Tennessee game late in the year would be a lot easier than the Auburn game would be. But that's not necessarily going to be that, that way moving forward. In fact, uh, ESPN NFL draft analyst Mel Kuyper Jr., he did like a conference call or something the other day where he was talking about all this uh, draft stuff, and I guess one of the Tennessee reporters must have asked him about something. He gave an answer, and Tennessee's put this on its official Twitter account. They're really promoting what Kuyper had to say. Uh, uh, Kuyper says of Tennessee, Jeremy Pruitt, the recruiting class coming in this year, is outstanding. The recruits are coming in are going to get back to Tennessee having a lot of early round picks. That's Mel Kuyper Jr. talking about Tennessee. That was tweeted out from the official Tennessee account. And I think there's an important point to be made here that when you make a decision about scheduling, that ought to be done with 15, 20, 25 years in mind. And the SEC, there's obviously a chance that they go to a nine-game conference schedule sometime soon and all this just gets rebooted. But assuming that doesn't happen, because as it stands right now, we don't know that it will, but assuming that doesn't happen, um, over the course of the last 25 years, you know, I, I don't know how much better Auburn's been than Tennessee. In fact, I don't know that they've been better overall. Tennessee has been down as of late. But you can't assume what's happened over the last couple of years is going to be uh, you know, happening forever. So another tactical error here that George has made, if it is true what Mike Griffith said, that he believes that Kirby Smart is okay with the trade of Auburn for Tennessee, I just think that's a flat-out just strategic tactical error on George's part to assume that the Tennessee game is going to be easier over the course of the next 20 years than the Auburn game, assuming this does last that long. I just think it's an error. I think it's an absolute mistake. I don't necessarily take Mel Kuyper at his word that – this recruiting class alone for Tennessee is going to change all that much. But clearly, Pruitt is a formidable recruiting foe, and they have, to their credit, they put together a pretty good staff. Derek Ansley coming in, it's pretty good. Um, they've done some good stuff. So um, and the, over the course of the next few years, the Tennessee game for Georgia is going to get more challenging for sure. All right, a couple of other things to uh, give to you here. Alabama, speaking of coaches finding a soft landing spot, they have hired another embattled head coach, Major Applewhite, whose uh, stint at Houston was a total disaster, is coming into Alabama again as an analyst. He was a one-time uh, uh, offensive coordinator there with the uh, program. I don't think he liked it very much. He, uh, he seemed to leave uh, pretty quick. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he is coming back as an analyst, and that's a, another extra pair of hands. Saban's really good at hiring those analysts, and uh, uh, having Applewhite working on that uh, offensive game plan will certainly help them. And then another, another uh, story that I wanted to mention, I saw where LSU had leaped to the top of the 2020 uh Recruiting class, the 24-7 sports composite team ranking. Uh, they're at number one now. They have really brought in a lot of big-time recruits. Capitalizing what was a great 2019 uh, 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 class as well. Ed Orgeron had had some recruiting misses a couple years ago that really kind of called into question his stewardship of the program. That has not been the problem the last couple of cycles. 2019 was stellar. 2020 is off to a big start as well. And LSU has reestablished itself as a major recruiting power. And obviously, Georgia fans know all about that they were able to flip John Amory Jr., the uh, running back, early in the cycle. So pay attention to Ed Orgeron on the recruiting trail. We'll make that your SEC through. All right, here on Dog Nation Daily, and as I said before, sorry, y'all, for the uh, tricky voice today. I apologize for not having a lot of oomph behind my words today. Hopefully tomorrow everything will be back to normal and I'll be sounding the way that I am used to sounding. It has been a, a little bit of a challenge today with the words. But no, nonetheless, I got a throat thing for those of you on either radio or video who are joining us a little late. I got a weird throat thing going on. I've had a hard time with that. So I appreciate your patience with me. I'm sure I must sound very annoying to you today, but I certainly apologize for that. But I want to go back to what we were talking about a little early in the show, and that's Dan Lanning, the rollout for him as defensive coordinator with Glenn Schumann as the co-defensive coordinator. I think this was a very odd thing from Georgia's perspective. Uh, Lanning, when he did speak on behalf of Georgia as its lead defensive guy 
according to the Sugar Bowl, was asked at the time if he was going to be the Georgia defensive coordinator. At the time, either he didn't know or wasn't ready to talk about it. So he kind of dodged the question. Here is some of what Dan Lanning had to say before Georgia took on Texas back in uh, January. Uh, you know, I don't really want to speak to that. Uh, right now, our focus is all on this game. You know, um, I, I have all the respect in the world for Mel Tucker. I love Mel Tucker. He's uh, been a great mentor and friend uh, in, in this business. Uh, but, you know, moving forward right now, our focus is, is on this game the first. Yeah, so uh, he would go on when he was asked about, you know, had he interviewed for the job? Was he up for the job? He, once again, you know, kind of dodged all of this, even admitting that, hey, listen, if he was a consideration, he wouldn't be the only guy that gets considered for this job. Here's more from Lanning. Our, our complete focus has been this game, you know, and then, you know, leading up to this game, we had our signing day, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think opportunities and decisions will be made. There's probably a, a ton of, and there is a ton of interest. This is the Georgia defensive coordinator job. There's a ton of interest in that job. We're going to be able to attract a lot of great candidates for that position. Um, you know, we have a lot of great people on staff and in-house. Uh, like I said, I think everybody's kind of taking a piece of the pie, stepping forward, moving into this game, and what it'll look like from a, a play caller, signal caller uh, standpoint into this game. Uh, and then after the game, I think there'll be some decisions made as what that looks like moving forward. I think part of the reason why George is being so secretive about this, and I don't think you can deny this, the failure of Tosh Lapoy, at least the reported failure of Tosh Lapoy as Alabama defensive coordinator a year ago. Another young coach was a good recruiter who got the promotion, and apparently, according to sources within the Alabama program, which is not ready for that job, Kirby might have that on his mind when it comes to Dan Lanning. We don't know because Kirby doesn't say anything about it, but uh, you're left to uh, assume that might be the case. One way or another, though, uh, Lanning is defensive coordinator, Schumann is co-defensive coordinator, defensive-minded Kirby Smart as a guy overseeing all of this. There'll probably be a lot of hands on that defensive game plan, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Here's more from Lanning on that point, uh, specifically related to the preparations for Texas. You know, I, I think uh, you know, a lot of people put a lot more into that than, than uh, is probably uh, the actual case. We make a lot of decisions during the week uh, before you ever get to the game. Uh, so when you, when you look at a specific situation in the game, a lot of those decisions have already been made. But I think the, the right answer is that everybody's going to be involved in that, just like they have been all week. You know, a combination of Coach Smart, Coach Schumann, Coach Scott, and myself are working really hard to put together a great plan and have a great plan uh, for these guys. But when, when you get into the game, a lot of times those decisions have already been made. Yeah, so I think for the most part what Lanning says there is probably true, that it, it's really the work you do in the week getting ready for the game that probably matters more than anything else. The defensive coordinator can be at least partially a symbolic role. But I do think there's also some value in the symbolism. And by Georgia not announcing publicly that Lanning's going to be the guy, that Schumann's going to be the co-defensive coordinator, what that relationship's going to be like. I think it leaves people to make their own assumptions, and Georgia's foes in the recruiting trail are going to try to color those assumptions of recruits in a negative way, and there's just no denying that. I think Georgia could have handled that better. Let me uh, sort of finish up, though, on a more positive note. Make sure you check out Chip Tower's piece at dognation.com. He was at the athletic board meeting yesterday, and there was a discussion that comes up about some new lights being put into Sanford Stadium, and they're like these you know, uh, professional stadiums now, NBA stadiums, where you can kind of you know, shut them off. The light-up Sanford thing's going to get very, very cool in the uh, years to come. That should be a lot of fun to see. Let me also tell you this, 845 days, that's how long it's been since those lousy, stinking Gators have beaten Georgia. That's good news. That's our Gatorator updater. We'll see you tomorrow right here on Dog Nation Daily. And on video, boy, it's been a long time since we've said that. It's good to be able to be able to say that again today, and great to uh, have you as part of our R.S. Andrews cool down. Uh, we do this each and every day. We get sort of hot and bothered during the show, and so we need a chance to cool down when it's all over with. We love the R.S. Andrews cool down uh, for that, and because no matter what the weather is, the one uh, that Dog Nature recommends is R.S. Andrews. They're the ones you, uh, they're the uh, you call, we come, it's fixed guys who arrive when promised, do the do only the work that's needed for an upfront guaranteed no surprise price. That goes for heating, air conditioning, plumbing, and electrical. When it comes to your home, go with the one we trust to play every position, R.S. Andrews. The ones we trust at Dog Nation, uh, check them out online at rsandrews.com. So here in the R.S. Andrews cool down, we'll get your thoughts on the Auburn series, the flip of Tennessee, and if you see something about that that does benefit Georgia, I'd love to hear it. I, I, I feel like I follow these kinds of things very closely. I don't understand this. It doesn't make any sense to me at all and I, I do think it hurts the perception of Georgia when fans are left to make their own decisions about stuff like this I think it calls them to question the 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 wisdom of the uh, of this 
of the strategy makers when something like this kind of goes unchecked. Uh, you can also talk about the uh, rollout of defensive coordinator as well and pretty much anything else you want to discuss. And, y'all, tomorrow I hope my voice sounds better. Um, James Crump says, welcome back, BA. I hope your break was relaxing. Boy, it really was. We stayed close to home. Um, kids were off of school, so uh, we just did a bunch of stuff like that. It was just really fun. Um, uh, we had a really good time. Really good time. Um, uh, really fun. Daniel Moore says, Jim Cheney looks svelte in that Tennessee orange. Yeah, I don't know if there's, there's any color that's less, um, uh, 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 I guess, flattering than the orange. <laughs> you know, it just makes you look like, now nah, I'm lucky that Georgia's color is red and black. I've, I've decided a long time ago that <clears throat> about the best, about the best, most flattering color of all is kind of the black. So um, I think that Jim Cheney's going to find that the, it's a whole new world having to wear that Tennessee orange on a regular basis for sure. Uh, let me get a comment here from um, uh, Jeff Purcell, who says, it is ridiculous to think that Kirby Smart is not publicly naming a defensive coordinator because he's afraid the D.C. might fail. Uh, uh, ridiculous, he says. So, Jeff, I think here's the problem with a lot of that, though. When there is no statement made whatsoever, people are going to be left to draw their own assumption. They are. And this is not about the media for me. This is about the fans. It's the fans who want to know, because the fact of the matter is, uh, the entire time that George was without a defensive coordinator, we operate on this show, and we said it nine million times, that one way or another, Dan Lanning was going to get a portion of this defensive coordinator job, and it was just a matter of did he get all of it or part of it. So around here, the defensive coordinator thing what was not that big of a deal to us. But you can look at my comment sections every single day on the R.S. Andrews cooldown, and over and over again, people were asking about it. It was the fans themselves that wanted to know. And with Georgia doing as much as it could to keep this information from becoming public, people are going to draw their own opinions about this, and they're not always going to be what you're going to want them to be or what George's going to want them to be. That's why you go public so you can control the narrative. If you don't construct your own narrative, a narrative is going to be constructed around you. And I, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I think that Kirby Smart totally mishandled the defensive coordinator role. I do. I think he completely mishandled it. Um, I, I think he diminished uh, Dan Lanning from the start. And I think that when Lanning tries to go <laughs> on the recruiting trail, you know, compared to other defensive coordinators around the league, I think that Lanning's going to be fighting a little bit of an uphill battle. Now, I think that Lanning's going to have a recruiter that he can handle that and be uh, just fine. But I think that uh, I think that somehow the the I guess the ghost of what happened with Tasha Poy last year, maybe that's on Kirby's mind or or whatever. Who knows? But whatever strategy was behind keeping this a secret, I just, I just think it was a mistake. I think it was a, a bad uh, a, a mistake. Um, Doug Rayburn says I sound like Coach O today. Yeah, I guess I'm glad I don't sound like this every day, but that, that's probably a, a pretty good call. Pretty good call. Mark Davis says welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, Philip Jordan Wells says it feels like we're discussing the Electoral College today. Uh, that's kind of a funny way of describing that. Um, Matt Rukamina says, given Kirby's background, B.A., maybe he just wants guys he can groom for defensive coordinator. I think that's a really good part of this. But um, I've also been of the belief that the title for something like this matters. You know, um, once again, for other coaches who might look to come to Georgia in the future, I I think there's something to be said for they don't want to be at a place where they're not going to be able to get full control of the defense because everybody knows it's Kirby's defense. I mean, even Kirby Smart himself, battled some of that when he was defensive coordinator at Alabama. Everybody knows it's Nick Saban's defense, people said. Now, I think we've, uh, we, we've learned that since then that, uh, that, that Kirby Smart certainly had, had plenty of say over that Alabama defense. But, but n- nonetheless, that's kind of the battle that, that you fight. All in all, does this end up being a real huge deal? Probably not. But um, little things like this do matter, and I think that uh, Georgia could have done this better. David Hamansky says, hot tea and some honey. That's a good suggestion, David. I appreciate that. Uh, Al Birchfield says, "B.A. get well soon. We got a, a big uh, season coming up. Yeah, hopefully, I'm better by tomorrow. Um, you should have heard me uh, yesterday." Brandon Vernon says he looks like the uh, Syracuse Orangeman mascot. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, Mark Cochran says on Facebook, "I'm gonna go to YouTube after this for a minute." The co-defensive coordinator is a great idea to always have someone that is a constant uh, because everyone keeps coming after our coaches. Players want continuity, and that is a, a great way to do it. Kirby's mind is still um, uh, behind it, uh, so we're good either way. That's an interesting. Um, uh, uh, that's an interesting um, uh, way of looking at it. Leslie Stokes Waller says, "Ba, 
you're awfully negative today. Did you have a bad vacation? No, I really didn't have a great vacation, but I have to admit, I think the Auburn thing was really bad. And I have to admit that the, uh, the defensive coordinator thing was pretty strange. I do have to admit that uh, I thought that, um, um, uh, I thought that uh, uh, you know, both those things could have just been handled better or at least explained a little bit better. I mean, I, I think that's the bigger issue. Um, so, but I apologize for being negative. If that's the way that you perceive me, I apologize for that. Uh, let me go over to a YouTube here for a moment as a part of our R.S. Andrews cool down. Uh, Richard Lumpkin says, making some bourbon with that hot tea and honey. <laughs> I don't know if that will uh, uh, make it work better, but it sure will taste better, I guess. Um, Kelly Burnett says, B.A. isn't being negative. He's telling it like it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's an, a really interesting dichotomy between negative, ne- negativity and positivity when it, when it comes to stuff like this. You know, sometimes Georgia fans get upset with their own program. It just it, it kind of happens. You know, not every decision that Georgia makes, and I mean institutionally, not every decision that Georgia makes is going to be one that fans agree with. There, there are a lot of things, um, if you listen to Georgia fans, that, that Georgia does all the time that kind of rubs people the wrong way. So, you know, as the Georgia guy doing the Georgia show here on Dog Nation Daily, you know, I, I, I don't really view it as my job to always – kind of carry the water for Georgia and whatever decision they've made, come on the show and explain why it's a good thing. That's not really the way that I view this. I think that what, you know, my job is, is to, um, is to, you know, re- reflect my thoughts on, uh, you know, a particular issue. And hopefully my thoughts on an issue are closely kept and closely in line with what other Georgia fans think. And on this one, especially when it comes to the scheduling deal with Auburn and Tennessee, I'm pretty sure, that at least the Georgia fans I've heard from this far, and a lot of this has been on Twitter at Dog Nation Daily, but thus far, I'm pretty sure that most people are kind of with me on this, that it's not clear what Georgia's getting on this, and this has a tendency to look a little bit too much like some of the ways which Georgia has just acquiesced to the uh, SEC uh, before. And in, in, in all of this, don't let it be forgotten, that this upcoming season in November, when Georgia's playing Texas A&M, go back and look at what every other SEC team's doing that week. The SEC has gotten a lot of grief for the so-called Cupcake Saturday. They needed to put some big game uh, on the schedule for that time. Well, you know, once again, it's uh, just miraculously ends up being Georgia who, um, you know, takes the bullet for the rest of the league. So the SEC can at least have one marquee game to, to, to show for that day. Uh, the very next week is Rivalry Saturday. The next week after that's the SEC Championship. Um, it just so happens that, uh, Georgia is gonna, gonna, gonna volunteer for that one too, I guess. Um, Crow King 123 says, Hey, BA, don't forget fans are short for fanatics. We get angry cause the AD, the coaches, uh, sometimes cause, uh, we care and want, uh, UGA to be great. Crow King, that's exa- exactly right. Um, ex- that's exactly right. Uh, Kara Killebrew says, uh, you can put it this way, uh, you'll never please a Georgia uh, fan because we always want the best. It's probably true as well. Daniel Moore asked a, a good question about the the basketball technical foul. What would the argument do, B.A.? Nothing. Uh, what do you think they're going to change the call? Obviously, not, they're not going to change this call, Daniel, but I think, I think it's a good question. I'm glad you asked. The issue is you want to create an environment where Stegman Coliseum is a tough place to come in and make that call. And listen, I, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. It's not my thing. But, I mean, I have a hard time believing that if I went to um, Lexington, Kentucky, Rupp Arena, uh, took out a little plush Wildcat uh, doll, threw that thing on the court, one instance of that is not leading to a technical foul. Because Rupp Arena has created the kind of mystique well, that's a call you cannot make. But last night in Stegman Coliseum, uh, an also-ran program like Georgia with a veteran coach on the other side, Ben Howland, who's been to Final Fours before, who's got a Mississippi State team trying to be in the tournament this year, that became a call that was very easy to make. You want to go screaming and yelling and, uh, and creating the kind of environment where it's just not easy to make that kind of call against you. We have seen over the last couple of years a lot of programs, athletic programs, have taken business in their own hands. I mean, let's face it. Uh, Greg Sankey is a very different commissioner than Mike Slive was and Roy Kramer was. There are a lot of athletic directors who feel very empowered to 
do their own bidding very publicly. Look at Joe Oliva, the LSU athletic director. Think about the way that the LSU Florida scheduling thing played out a couple of years ago when I think that Florida tried to play its back channels to uh, get that game uh, changed, and Joe Oliva basically fought back. He got his way. Now, as it turns out, it didn't work out very well because LSU lost the home game that it got against Florida and had to go to a Gainesville two years in a row after that. One of those didn't end up winning, but overall that didn't work out as a win for LSU, but the the immediate win belonged to LSU because Joe Oliva just fought back. He became uncooperative publicly, and when, when, you're, when you're that way, you have a tendency to get what you want. I think that the instance involving Georgia and Mississippi State last night would be a very easy way for Georgia to go public. Have somebody back up and defend Tom Crane and say, hey, listen, my coach is sort of uh, bound by league rules not to complain too much about the officiating, but I'm not. Here's what happened. This is a disgrace. The SEC owes us an apology. If nothing else, you plant the seed where doing something like that in Stegman Coliseum in the future is just a lot harder to do. I think that's the right, I think that's the right way to go about that. I've been watching, I've been rewatching Game of Thrones now as the final season sure. comes up. Fantastic television. The way Georgia goes about handling things and sort of politically maneuvering reminds me a lot of how the Stark family maneuvers things. They try to do things the right way. You yeah. know, they try to have honor. And I just think in college athletics, like, that's just not how you can afford to operate. Like, you have to look out for your best self in can't look out for everybody. You have to take things into your hand, you know. And I and I wrote this in the last couple of Good Day UGAs and why I get so why I very against moving this Auburn game. So you move this, you know, to acquiesce Auburn, and you know you blow up a tradition that the last time, the last time Georgia and Auburn didn't play in November, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was still a one-term president, was facing an election. Can you believe that? If you change this, what's to stop you from saying, hey, let's move the Georgia Tech game up to the beginning of the season. That way, at the end of the season, you know, we're playing, you know, that FCS or Sun Belt team to get ready for the SEC game. Yeah. It's a theoretical, easier game, regardless of how Tech is doing. Um, and then, you know, what's to say, and there's been, you know, some rumblings and mentions of this out there, what's to stop them from, you know, pulling the Georgia-Florida game out of Jacksonville every year and, you know, making it regular home and home where you go to Athens, you go to Gainesville, you know, and the reason for that would be just you know, the recruiting benefit. You know, everything. Yeah. When you start changing one or two traditions, you know, you then begin to wonder what everything looks like at the end. And, you know, you get a situation like the old Big East, which was by far the best basketball conference. Now, you know, it's a shell of itself yeah. because all that tradition was overridden because people wanted to grab cash. And, that's that's where I think the worry, and a lot of Georgia fans also have that same. I think it's really interesting. That's Connor Alley, by the way. I think it's really interesting that you bring that up because people would expect, you know, you being much younger than me to not necessarily value tradition because a lot of younger people don't. Like, I am kind of a traditionalist. I believe that all traditions, for the most part, exist for a reason. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. Um, I think it's an interesting point you're bringing up that, you know, you pull one tradition out, and it's not that big of a deal because there's a practical reason for making the change. You pull another one out. The last one worked. I'll, I'll, I'll pull this tradition out, too, because there's also a practical you know, reason for wanting to make this change. You keep doing that enough, what you're eventually left with is an unrecognizable version of the sport that you used to have. I mean, I grew up in an era in which the last three games that Georgia played every year were Florida, Auburn, Georgia Tech. Those three rivalries, three games in a row, it was a referendum on your season. How good is Georgia? Well, we're about to find out against these three rivalry opponents. Now, back then, Georgia still had a lot of rivals. They were, you know, playing Clemson in most years and Tennessee in some years, South Carolina as a non-SEC team in every year. But it was those three big rivals at the end of every season. That was really fun. Now, in modern times, that's not likely to happen. People would want a little more space in their schedule. But Auburn in November is a tradition that matters. Now, what's the tangible value of, of playing that game in November? I'm not sure. But for Georgia, just to, to give that part of it up without not giving some voice to hey, this has been a tradition around here for a long time. It's the Deep South's oldest rivalry. At the very least, I think you bring that up as a negotiating ploy. What worries me about this is it's hard to tell how Georgia negotiated for this at all. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's what I think is really confused, uh, confusing about all this. Um, 
uh, Mark Cochran says, I think it's dumb for us not to play Auburn in the end. It's part of the uh, gauntlet. It throws shade towards Tennessee, doesn't it? Well, if it unintentionally throws shade towards Tennessee, uh, Mark, I think that's going to end up being uh, maybe the biggest mistake in all of this. Assuming the schedule t- stays in place for a number of years, I mean, if you l- look at the last 50 years as your guide, there's no guarantee that Auburn is going to keep being better than Tennessee just because it has been better these last three or four years. Over the course of the long haul, Tennessee and Auburn, for the most part, are you know fairly e- equal programs. And o- over the course of the long range of history, Tennessee's been actually the uh, better of the two programs. So by trading Auburn for Tennessee, if you're going to look at the next 10 or 15 years, Georgia has not gotten itself an easier November opponent. Now, it'll probably be easier in, uh, in 2019, but if you, if you want to fast forward ahead to 2027, uh, the, the idea that uh, Tennessee's likely to be worse than Auburn, history would not suggest that's the case. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as much as we've, you know, questioned Jeremy Pruitt and sort of his long-term viability, there's a better chance by the time that 2020 season rolls around, Jeremy Pruitt is still coaching at Tennessee, whereas there's not really a guarantee that Auburn yeah. is. You know, I, it's funny, it's ironic it might be, you know, let's say Auburn, you know, they lose to Oregon Open here. They, and I know we've, we've gone back and forth. With this. Let's say they do go, you know, 7-5 and five and they end this season again with at uh, home losses to Georgia and Alabama, which is certainly plausible given just how good Georgia and Auburn might be. You know, it'd be a little bit ironic that Gus Malzahn and Auburn, who fought so hard to change this, have to end up firing their head coach at the end of the season Boston and Alabama. David Hamansky brings up an interesting point. He says, I get the feeling the SEC office told us this was happening. We didn't have a choice. I'd love to hear from the SEC on that. You know, you know did Georgia have the opportunity? Jerry Moorhead uh, seemed to say both sides of this, that the SEC told us that this was happening. Our athletic director vetted it, and our coach is on board with it. Um, it's difficult to take from that statement which one carried the more weight, uh, McGarity and Smart agreeing to do this or the SEC office telling them they're going to do this. Uh, there's also a, a quote I wanted to get in here, too, as well. Um, uh, where, where did this one go? Somebody brought up that, um, that for Tennessee, this actually probably works out pretty well, too, and I apologize for not finding that comment. But that, Because if you look at Tennessee, you got Florida early in the season. You've got Georgia right there, typically first Saturday in October. Third Saturday in October is, is Alabama, and that's not moving. And by the way, that's uh, two programs smart enough to preserve a tradition. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got, you know, that situation sort of like, you know, late September through uh, late October where Tennessee's schedule is very packed. Tennessee's schedule in November typically gets pretty soft. That's, where, that's when they play teams like Kentucky and Vanderbilt. Usually, they've actually finished some years against Kentucky. They haven't always played Vanderbilt the last game of the season. So for uh, Tennessee, it's easy to see why this is a win. Now, you may say, well, if they get back to winning the SEC East, they may not want to play Georgia that late in the year. That's something you worry about once you get there if you're the Vols. As it stands right now, Tennessee probably also got a win from this by kind of cleaning up what had been a little bit of a gauntlet from them from, like, say, third Saturday in uh, in September through third Saturday in October. Right. And so I think with Tennessee, this is a really big win because, you know, as you mentioned, traditionally Tennessee's late season November games, and I'm talking about this from a recruiting standpoint, they've been, you know, Kentucky, Missouri, and now those games don't really, you know, make you want to come out and attend those games. If, if I were, none of those games are sort of big, big name games. You know, it's not the Georgia Auburn, uh, Auburn, Alabama. This now gives Tennessee, I think, a, you know, in, with Jeremy Pruitt going forward, this now gives them a marquee late season circle on the schedule. Let's try to have a ton of our recruits here. It's going to be a hot at here at Neyland Stadium, which that, you know, I mean, yes, when Georgia plays them in an early October or late September, depending on the year, it's still a big game in a big environment. But those late season games, you know, there's a reason the Kobe Dean, Tyreek Stevenson, made it a point to be at the Georgia Auburn game this year. Yeah. And, you know, going forward, I think Tennessee sort of gets that some gets that little feather to add yeah. into its cap. That's a really that's a really good point. That's a very good point. Um uh let me get a few more comments. Rob Dibble brings up the Florida game. That was the other thing that was kind of weird to me about this was that, you know, McGarity's public stance on this has been, hey, the one thing we don't want to change is the Georgia Florida. Even if you don't want to change that by <laughs> Stating that publicly, all you've done is weaken your negotiation position for the uh, next contract you signed with with Jacksonville for that game. I mean, 
to me, it's another example of Georgia maybe not negotiating all of this publicly in the wisest, most aggressive way possible. Uh, Joey Smiley also brings up a good point. Uh, he says, so if our schedule suddenly gets tough because teams get better, we can just ask for a schedule change, LOL. And that is such a, uh, a, a great point packed into a question. It's a, it's a few words that pack quite a punch because two things here. I mean, first of all, that's really what this is. All of a sudden, Georgia's better than they used to be, so Auburn needs a schedule change, and they just get it like that. I mean, that's amazing to me. But they said, oh, Georgia's gotten too tough. Therefore, we need to change this game. And the SEC is like, sure, go ahead. Uh, we'll make it even easier uh, f- for you in the future. I mean, it is really interesting to see. I mean, think about two back-to-back games that Georgia plays. I, I don't even know what they would be. But um, if Georgia said, hey, guess what? You know, we kind of want this to be a change now because this has just gotten to be too hard. Um, I mean, it's hard to imagine Georgia would like be getting the benefit of it. Theoretically, let's say Georgia is – schedule they play the sec west foe before they're by and then florida you know this year happened to be lsu other years you know it'll be alabama you know theoretically this year Texas yeah. A&M. you know i don't i don't think georgia would have gone and complained about hey we need to change the schedule around we're facing a tough foe right another tough foe and you know it, it's getting glossed over auburn has a cupcake game in between those two. yeah it's true you know it, it's it's not like and even before the Georgia game, you know, it's not like they're going LSU, Georgia, Alabama three in a row. You know, LSU is traditionally an early season game. And actually, you know, I have some friends in the Auburn beat. The concern now might be, as funny as this is, you play LSU late September, like Georgia early October. You know, does mm-hmm. that really solve much of anything? I mean, yes, LSU is not Alabama. But they're still a very good team that Auburn hasn't beaten in Baton Rouge since, like, 1999, I want to say. They have so, not won there since 1999, but th- that's not as high profile as the 11-14 of to Georgia and the, you know, th- even though Auburn has beaten Alabama, beat them as recently as 2017, the rise of Alabama has been a huge problem for Auburn and Gus Malzahn in particular. And the Georgia part of this, as I said during the regular show, to me, it's a solution in search of a problem because Georgia's handled Auburn easily, has won every game at Tech since, ironically, also 1999, You know, this idea that Georgia needs to do something to break up those back-to-back road games, uh, more than a decade's worth of history would say, no, that's not the case. And if I'm doing the math correctly here, I believe since 2006, Auburn has more wins against Alabama than it does. How about that? How about that? So, I mean, part of this is that Auburn, I mean, almost clearly is just looking to change up the momentum of this Georgia-Auburn rivalry. And as, um, let me find this quote on YouTube because I thought it was an important point to bring up. Um, um, somebody said um, I, I, I can't find it now and I apologize somebody said that uh, George is not necessarily losing in this they're just not gaining anything I think the important point to bring up is that when someone else is gaining something you need to at least get something for yourself uh, otherwise you've just made it easier for your foes in this case, I think that's exactly what's going on here. Georgia's just made things a little easier for Auburn, and frankly, probably a little easier for Tennessee uh, there as well. Uh, you know, Georgia's not, as you say, losing. They're just changing up a scenario to make things easier for Auburn. But Auburn having a better scenario is, I mean, to a certain extent, worse for Georgia because the SEC and college football in general is kind of a, a zero-sum game. Kelly Burnett, change is the only constant in college football right now. I agree. I, I think that's a really good point. You know, you look at some of the other traditions that have been moved because, you know, teams want it easier or they prefer the cash-grabbing route yeah. instead of just, you know, sticking out and making it a better college football product. Every offseason we talk about when are Texas and Texas A&M going to play again. Right. You know, it's a yearly storyline. Presidents are talking about it. Students are talking about it. Uh, the governor talks about it. And we in college football threw that away because A&M wanted the SEC Right, yeah. And, exactly. the two, and the two sides just were like, all right, well, we'll take this SEC money instead of playing Big 12 foes. And I just, I think that may, like, college football is undoubtedly worse off because Texas and Texas A&M don't play each other. And I think that there's a really good chance that, using Kelly's line, that change is the only constant, that this all may be a short-term deal for Georgia anyway because, I mean, there's already been a lot of public hints that the SEC could consider a nine-game schedule. I think eventually it's going to have to to get the most money possible from new TV deals, and I think when it does that, the entire schedule will be changed anyway because nothing to these guys matters 
more than money anyway. And so um, if they have a chance to make more money, they'll just flip flop and do the schedule or whatever they need to do at that point in time. So there is a chance that the entire schedule looks very different in the future. For instance, the fact that as it stands right now in 2029, which you know, you blink your eyes, that won't be that far away. Georgia's currently scheduled to go play at Texas. I, I forget if it's the home game or the road game. Uh, but Home Texas at Clemson. Home with Texas at Clemson in September of 2029. At Georgia Tech. I'm just telling you right now, that's not happening. I'm just telling you right now, that is not happening. Uh, um, so, so we are at least in a scenario where I believe within the next decade, there's going to be a massive change to the schedule coming because th- there's just no way that Georgia will play those three non-conference games in the same season given the way the uh, current landscape of college football looks. So if that happens by 2029, that means the, the, the wheels for that are going to start spinning well before that. So there's a very good chance that all of this ends up being kind of a short-term fix anyway. But why George would want to give any kind of alleviation to Auburn during that short-term issue that, to me, is where this ends up being the issue. Yeah, if you're looking for a, a date or dates around when we sort of start to expect those changes, look, 2024, 2025, that's when they're going to start renegotiating those TV deals. That's when they're going to renegotiate the college football playoff. That's when a lot of these things are going to start getting changed. Um, and one other thing, k Blues brought up this point about um, the uh, getting the Auburn home game. I mean, they're obviously not going to go into the – political discussions that they had about getting this game, but it's, it, based off the press statement McGarity put out, you know, it doesn't sound like Georgia made a real big effort to try to get that extra yeah. game back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly not as public as Alan Green did, the Auburn athletic director. Yeah. Uh, l- let me also get a quote from YouTube over here from um, Ashim Spikes, who says, I see your point on this being easier for Auburn, but if UGA maintains the current status, has become easier for Tennessee. Well, Ashim, let's look at Tennessee's 2018 schedule for a moment. Starting on September 22nd, they played Florida, lost 47-21. The following Saturday, they played uh, at Georgia, lost 38-12. They were off. Then they played at Auburn. That's the rotating SEC West game. Uh, lost 30. Actually, they won that game. They won that game. 30-24. Um, and then they played Alabama. That's the permanent third Saturday in October. Uh, which they lost 58-21. to 21. That's a, I mean, listen, no kidding, but that's a gauntlet of a schedule. Florida's a huge game for Tennessee every single year, though those two programs have trended very closely in the same direction. Uh, Georgia's become a grizzly bear to deal with. Even though you got the off week in between that and what happened um, the following Saturdays, uh, that's still a really tough four-game stretch over the course of five weeks. Florida at Georgia at Auburn and then Alabama. When you get to November for, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, Tennessee, you've got Charlotte, Kentucky, Missouri, which they got blown out. But nonetheless, Missouri's kind of, a, you know, historically an also-ran program. They also got blown out by Vanderbilt. But the point is, is that, you know, that's a pretty easy November schedule, even though Tennessee only went 2-2 two and two in those games. Yeah, Charlotte, Kentucky, Missouri, and Vanderbilt. Yeah, if you want to look at, Georgia, I would say, Georgia's 2019 November slate, where they, uh, or where they go November 1st, they're Florida against Missouri, home against Missouri the next week, at Auburn, and then Texas A&M and Georgia Tech to round out the season. I mean, that's, I, in my opinion, that's a more brutal five-game stretch than what Tennessee would ever have to go through at, you know, late September, early October. But if you're Tennessee and you have a chance to break that up and move a game to November, you just do it. Right, exactly. You do it. I think this move, more than it benefits Auburn, it really, I think it really benefits Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. Here's their 2019 schedule. It's uh, Florida on September 21st. It's off before Georgia. There are two bye weeks on yep. this year's schedule. And Georgia's, uh, has, Georgia's off that week as well. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's Florida at Florida, Georgia. Then it's Mississippi State at Alabama. And the, the Mississippi State's a home game, so that doesn't really count as the hardest of, uh, of hard games. But that's still at Florida, Georgia, at Alabama over the course of uh, five weeks. If you can break that up, you just want to do it. And so that's why I think that Tennessee really gains from this. It's kind of funny. They've been kind of quiet through all of this because uh, they're really, you know, uh, the institution that really does benefit from a lot of this, uh, for sure, for sure. All right, we're going to get ready to go. I think my voice is about to completely give out. Um, I really don't know what's wrong, y'all. I mean, um, I woke up Tuesday morning with a sore throat, and let me tell you something. It has been like razors in my throat ever since then. I, I just don't get sick. I don't get sick at all. Um, 
But uh, I have been kind of uh, worse to wear a little bit the last couple of days. We'll yesterday, put up, we'll put up a, a medical tent. Take a look at. It. Yeah, you'll just pop that thing up. So yesterday, I will tell this story before I leave. So um, last day of my you know planned vacation, um, so I just didn't even really feel like getting out of bed. So um, some of y'all know that I like wrestling, but I don't get to really watch it too much anymore. So I had all these like Monday Night Raws and SmackDown saved up and recorded. So I just sat in bed yesterday and watched a million of these things. It's actually, a pretty fun day. Um. From that standpoint, being sick is not so bad, but um, I didn't really feel like uh, being, uh, uh, didn't really feel like moving around a whole lot yesterday, but it was kind of fun to uh, sit around and, um, uh, and kind of enjoy all of that. All right, so hopefully coming back tomorrow, um, hopefully coming back tomorrow, I'll sound a lot better. My guess is I probably will, because I actually, believe it or not, I sound better now than I did yesterday. So I feel like tomorrow we should be uh, close to 100% now. I don't think I sound that great when I'm fully healthy, but. Uh, nonetheless, uh, hopefully we'll be back. It has been really fun to be with you today. Really appreciate that. Huge thanks to R.S. Andrews for making the uh, the R.S. Andrews cool down possible. Do want to remind you that they are the ones that we trust here around Dog Nation for heating and air, plumbing, electrical. They do all of that uh, for you. So, listen, th- this time of year, I-, I think about R.S. Andrews a lot because <laughs> I know it's kind of cold and rainy today, but, I mean, it's going to be springtime before you know it. And the other day it was, um, you know, uh, warm. We had to, you know, cook that air, hit that air conditioning on and you know for a lot of people when they do that for the first time it doesn't work the way that you want it to so you want to make sure you get the air conditioning ready to go for the uh the upcoming warm weather season that the uh, furnace can get you through the rest of the uh, winter and kind of everything in between uh, as we like to say they're the ones we trust to play every position because they can do it all for you uh, so check them out online at rsandrews.com Dari's a, a great friend of dog nation a big dog guy himself he goes with us to us a lot of these road games and he's a just a really good guy. You'll love R.S. Andrews. And so if you've got a heating air, air issue or a plumbing or electrical issue, um, if you've got to have something checked out around your house, they are the ones that we trust, R.S. Andrews. Find them online at rsandrews.com. All right, I will see you tomorrow. Uh, huge thanks to Connor Riley and Michael Carvel for uh, having us on the air today, and we will uh, talk to you back here again tomorrow for both for R.S. Andrews Cooldown and at 10 a.m. for Dog Nation Daily. Y'all have a great day. We'll look forward to seeing you then.